the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Indian Trail.
Oh, let's continue to worship, can we? You know this song. Sing it out. Some glad morning when this life is over. What are you going to do? Here I am, 
Oh, let's sing it again. Here I am to worship. Here I am. So we've come to do today. We worship you. Yes. Sing, we have come. We have come to worship Jesus with our hands lifted high and with all our hearts we have found. Just sing his name. Jesus. We love you, Lord. Jesus. Oh, come on, lift him up today. He's worthy to be praised. We love you, Father. We thank you. We worship you. Amen. You may be seated. At the name of Jesus, right? Things change in our lives at the name of Jesus. Our hearts are healed at the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is why we're in this place. At the name of Jesus, amen? amen. Man, thank you. Welcome to First Baptist if you're new. Man, we are excited to have you in this place. And today, we want you to do that very thing with us. Just worship the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we did Chalk It Up to Love, which is where we collected school supplies for our Title I schools. And look at all these pictures. We had 54 boxes of supplies that we got to give out. And that speaks to your generosity as of a church. And we're able to go to those schools and just say, hey, we're First Baptists. We want we, you to know that we're for you and that we love you and we appreciate what you're doing. And so thank you for your faithfulness. And ladies, this coming Thursday, September the 5th, uh, you need to come. We're going to be having Anchored in the Word. And uh, you can go online, sign up for that. Uh, most of you do this. Y'all wait till the last minute. Just to let y'all know, this is last minute, all right? And uh, we want to be prepared for you. So if you haven't done that, would you do that today or tomorrow? Then we look forward to you ladies being on campus. And by the way, I'm going to come by because somewhere in there it said there were snacks. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to come for the snacks and just to see what they are doing. But, uh, but man, I hope that you have ladies have made plans for that because there's nothing more important in the body of Christ than the body of Christ getting together and studying the Word together. So I pray that you will be a part of that. And then today, we get to do one of my favorite things in church. And I know y'all think I'm a little bit crazy, but don't you love to give back to the Lord? Isn't it a privilege to give back to Him for He has so richly blessed us? And so right now, our ushers are going to come in just a moment. And we don't want you to give out of compulsion. We want you to give out of gratitude for what the Lord has done for you. And to see what God can do in this place with what you have given so freely. This week, I had a meeting with... Uh, some of the guys that are going, or one of the guys that are going to back to Panama coming up hopefully in October. And let me just tell you, I mean, in five minutes, I could just see passion. And I could see and listen to them talk about going in to do evangelism and things like that. And here's how they're able to do that. 
because you're faithful in giving. And so it doesn't affect just right here. It affects, us the, it affects the whole entire globe. So if you would, make sure that you take advantage of an opportunity of blessing to let the Lord bless you. And thank you for your faithfulness. We're going to bless this offering. And then, man, I'm telling you, this next song is good. In Gastonia, we say gooder. All right? But it's about to get gooder. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. We are so excited about the next few minutes and being able to give back to you. And God, I thank you for the song this choir and Steve are about to sing. God, I thank you for what it meant to my heart, standing in the back just thinking about your goodness. God, what you've done for us. And God, we just pray right now for that person that might be sitting here in this room that are here and they're discouraged. God, remind them today of your faithfulness. God, speak to our hearts. And then God, speak to our through our pastor today as we begin a new series. God, use it to change our lives for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is this the prayer of your heart? Sing it with us if you can.
as we tarry there. And the joy we you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians in that first chapter. Philippians chapter number one, and some of you may have a little trouble getting into the epistles. The way I remember them sometimes is General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, GEPC, that first chapter. We're going to start a brand new series this morning. I I thought it uh, may not be the sharpest pencil in the box starting a new series on a holiday weekend, uh, but I really felt impressed by the Lord that this is where that I would want to be, and I'm grateful for all of you beachgoers, uh, mountain climbers that have tuned in with us today. I'm grateful you had the money to get away, and we were, so we just really rejoice that you're there. Actually, we do. But glad to have our live stream audience with us today. I, I've uh, digging into a book. I think we did it a number of years ago, but not from the perspective that we are going to look at it uh, on this go round. It is a very personal book. It's a very practical book. It's a problem solving book. And I believe that you're going to find that it's probably the most positive book in all of the New Testament. 17 times he uses the word joy or rejoice or enjoy uh, in this wonderful little letter. And one of the things that he does through the book of Philippians is that he uh, identifies and targets the joy killers. Uh, in our life. Now, you know what I mean by joy killer, don't you? You know that people have a way of being a joy killer. Can I get a witness from anybody? And that's the very first thing that the Apostle Paul begins to attack in this little book. He wants to talk about how in the world do you deal with joy killing people? I think one of the greatest books I ever read was by John Maxwell called Be a People Person. And it blessed me incredibly and really changed my life. I want to ask you a question. Do you enjoy the people around you? Do you enjoy your husband? Do you enjoy your wife? Do you enjoy your family? Do you enjoy your boss? 
Do you in? <laughs> I pray to God that that was not a staff member. Ecclesiastes 9 says, Husbands, enjoy your wife that you love with all of your heart. Enjoy her. Do you love her? Do you enjoy it? The problem with a lot of marriages, though, is that uh, husbands and wives are enduring one another rather than enjoying one another. They put up with one another or tolerate one another rather than enjoying one another. I was uh, on vacation this year and uh, typically Kathy and I would walk together, but this particular day I was walking by myself and uh, it was kind of toward the end of the day. Got around to the back side of the circle in our neighborhood and I came across this woman who was walking her dog like most of the people in my neighborhood do. And I was going to preach that Sunday morning and I invited her to come to church. And she got to telling me all of the reasons that she couldn't and wouldn't go to church. How she detested church. How she thought that it was full of hypocrites and I've tried them all. And uh, I, every time she presented an objection, I would come at her from a little different direction. And I finally just told her, I said, well, ma'am, the, the, the thing you've got to remember about church is you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. You can't get your eyes on people. You'll always get disappointed in that way. And she but responded by saying, well, the fact of the matter is, sir, I just don't like people. Well, she shut me up, so I just turned around and left. I didn't have anything else to say. I want to talk to you this morning from what Paul is doing here with the church at Philippi. I want to talk to you about how to enjoy the people that are around you. And the first thing I want to share with you that jumps out at me out of this scripture is that you have to focus on the good that is in people. Pick it up with me, if you will, at verse one. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to watch with me verse three because this is one of the most incredible verses I think that's in all of this little letter. He says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Wow. Now Paul is just making a volitional choice here in his life he says, I am choosing to remember the things that brought me pleasure. I am remembering the good things that you contributed to, to my life. I am choosing not to focus in on the bad things that happened to me while I was in Philippi. I am choosing to focus in on all of the good that occurred to me while I was there. I want to ask you a question before I go any further. What do you think about when somebody presents to you a certain name of a particular individual? Do you automatically think about how blessed you are to have them in your life? Or do you think about some negative aspect that happened somewhere in the history that you had with that person? And the first thing that goes to your mind is the negative side of that relationship. Do you think about a good experience or do you think about a bad experience? Now the background behind verse three is in Acts chapter number 11. All you have to do is just go read it and you're going to discover that when Paul shows up at Philippi, he is arrested, he is beaten, he's thrown into prison, he experiences an earthquake and ultimately they kick him out and dismiss him out of the town. But now then he's riding back to that church in Philippi and he makes this amazing statement. He says, I thank God for every remembrance of you. 
All of that great stuff that occurred while I was there. He could have had resentment and bitterness and hostility in his heart for the way that he was treated while he was there. But instead he chose to remember all of that good stuff. The things that he could be grateful about in his life. Maybe somewhere in your past Maybe in your history, there's been some individual back there that deeply hurt you, caused you all kinds of pain, and right now, you're choosing to hold on to that hurt, and you can't enjoy them today because of what they did to you yesterday, and you can't be grateful for the good in people because you're remembering all of the bad in the people. Understand something, ladies and gentlemen, pleasant memories of people is a choice that Paul made, and it's a choice that you and I make as well. I can choose to remember. I can choose to remember the good in other people. Now, I'm not saying that you need to pretend that whatever happened back there never did happen. I'm not saying to you that you can excuse away what they did to you in their life. But what I am saying is be grateful for what you have and focus in on the good. Never once in a while, a woman will walk up or she'll say to me, you know, my husband is a good man, but, and I know what's coming next. She is about to spew out some negative poison about him. You understand that but is a choice. It is a choice that you make at that moment in time what you're going to talk about. And, and, and Paul is saying to us through this passage, I believe, is that we need to be grateful for the good that we have in other people. By the way, wives, Mr. Perfect does not exist. Now, some of you husbands say, yes, he does. My wife's ex, he must have been perfect because I hear about it all the time. Now, I want you to understand something. I am a fiercely loyal man, fiercely loyal. It was a major attribute of the apostle Paul. In verse number five, watch this, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. <laughs> he said, man, I want to tell you, I am loyal uh, to that. I am fiercely loyal. I want to ask you this question. Uh, who's been loyal to you? Has your mate stood by you? Ha has, the, has your boss stood by you along the way? People at work? Now, I'm not talking about anything spectacular. I, I'm just talking about time and time and time again when those people, your mate or somebody at work, had the opportunity to walk away. Had the, uh, had the opportunity to abandon, had the opportunity to just slip out, and they didn't. They hung in there. Uh, maybe it was during a crisis. Maybe it was a change in careers. Or maybe it was you just being a jerk. But they stayed with you. Paul is teaching us here, appreciate that. Major on that. Love that. Focus in on that. Right relationships and in relationships that you can enjoy will always focus in on the good that somebody else has done or is bringing to that relationship, not on maybe their faults and their failures. If you're ready to go to number two, say amen. amen. All right, focus in on the good in others. Number two, faithfully go to God on their behalf. Faithfully seek God on their behalf. Watch this in verse four. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. How in the world would you like to have the apostle Paul praying for you? 
How would you like to have the guy who wrote 13 books of the New Testament going to God on your behalf and seeking God to encourage you and to lift you up? Uh, I want to tell you, I thank God for all of you and, and many that don't even go to this church that nearly every day of my life, when the mail is coming in my office, I'm opening up some kind of encouraging note or I'm uh, uh, opening up a, an email that somebody has sent me, not wanting anything in return, just saying to me words of encouragement. When I was preparing for this message, I happened to notice a little uh, tattered sheet of paper on my desk. And uh, I said, well, what is that? And I picked it up and it was a uh, a little note that my granddaughter had written me seven months ago that I, I keep there on my day. I'm not going to file it. It'll be right there. And I read it from the top to the bottom. One of the most encouraging, if not the most encouraging little note that I have ever received from anybody. You, you ever get those kinds of notes? You ever get that kind of encouragement? Paul says, I pray for you. What, 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 how much that should have encouraged the church at Philippi sometime about three thirty, four o'clock Friday morning, it just hit me that my attitude and disposition wasn't exactly like it ought to have been about a particular situation and a person. And, and I just went before God and I said, you know what, God, uh, I, I want you to bless that person. I, I, I really, they, they need you desperately in their life. And, and God, I want you to do a work. And I just got real specific as to what I wanted God to do in their heart uh, and in their life. I want you to do that. Now, you understand that the best way to change a bad relationship is to seek God on their behalf and start praying for them and thanking God for that relationship. Now, this is going to do two things. Number one, it's going to change your attitude toward them. Positive praying, ladies and gentlemen, is a whole lot better than positive thinking. When they don't receive your advice, when they reject your suggestions, when they really resent any help that is coming from you, I want to tell you there's one thing that they can't do one thing about, and that is they are powerless to do anything about you praying for them. Lift them up. I was doing a funeral one time and I looked down at these grandchildren and I, I knew their grandmother and I knew what their lives were like. And I, 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 their grandmother was there and in, in that casket and I looked down at those boys and, and I said, I want to tell you boys something. You can run as far as you can run from God and you can run away from a lot of things but there's one thing that you will never escape, and that is the prayers of your godly grandmother. You can reject all of the advice. You can reject all of the encouragement. You can just refuse somebody's help along the way, but you can't do anything about them going to God on your behalf. And Paul is doing just exactly. I want you to watch. He says, I'm praying for you. Now, I want to ask you something. When, uh, when, when somebody comes up to you with a request and maybe they come up to you with an issue that's going on in their life and you'll say, well, I'll be praying for you. What does that really mean? Most of the time, if we're honest, when we get to praying for somebody, here's what, we, God, will you bless them? Will, will you bless them? Understand something. Specific prayers bring about specific answers. And I want you to watch with me what Paul, Paul prayed four things for the church at Philippi. Number one, he says this, watch this in verse nine. Let me, let me just read a couple of verses here. He says, in this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Here's what he did. He prayed four things. Number one, he says, I pray that you grow in love. Grow in love. 
Now the King James says abound. That, that means to overflow. It literally uh, translates a whole lot better by saying, I pray for a soon that your, your love grows like a tsunami. And second, he says, I pray that you will make some wise choices. Third, he prays, I pray that you'll do the right thing. And the fourth thing that he prayed, he says, I pray that your life would be lived for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he prayed very specifically. If you want to enjoy the people that are around you, like Paul enjoyed the people at Philippi, you're going to have to quit focusing in all, all the negative things of their life, focus in on the good that they bring to the table, and then you seek God on their behalf on a regular basis. Number three, you ready? Forget how far they still have to go. Remember how far they've come. Forget how far they have to go. And remember how far down the road they've already come. Look at verse six. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You've heard me say this a million times. What God starts, God finishes. Do y'all know anybody that has little projects that they've started along the way, but they never did finish it? Y'all got anybody like that in your life? Do you know anybody like that? I do. I know a guy who started more little projects and has never finished one of them that I know of. Maybe it's a book. Maybe it's a symphony. Maybe it's a building. But you start something that they never do finish. That's what man does. But God is not like that. You will never see an incomplete flower. You will never see a partial star. When God started putting all this stuff together in seven days, he stands back and he looks at what he has done and he says, wow, this is good. He finishes what he starts. May I say, whatever God started in your life, he will finish it. Thank God, God started something in me on April the 12th in 1970. And one of these days, I'm going to stand in his presence and I'm going to see him as he is. And I will be at that moment, everything that he's ever designed for me to be. I'm not happy with where I am right now. I am grateful to God that I'm not like I once was, but hallelujah, I'm not what I'm going to be because God is going to finish what he has started in me. You husbands and wives in your relationship, if you're going to enjoy that marriage, you're going to have to allow some room for growth and development. Women, if you're gonna enjoy your husband, you can't put a standard and line up there and say, okay, when he gets to that point, then I'll enjoy him. But the problem with that is that people that do that kind of stuff, when that man gets to that point, she's already got another line already drawn up there. Mm -hmm. Thank God that he's not like he used to be. Thank God that he has grown where he is today and begin to seek God on his behalf that he'll become everything that he's designed him to be. And until that time, enjoy the journey that you're on together. I'm getting a little bit passionate. I, I will try my best to calm down. There's no such thing as a perfect husband or a perfect wife. And if you're expecting that out of your relationship, you are going to be miserable on waiting on them to become that. Learn to enjoy each other right now. John 1, 12, the Bible says he gave them power to become, to become the sons of God. This is a process that we are on. And the apostle Paul says, I am confident. I am assured I know that God's power is going to continue to work in their life. He never gave up on people. Don't give up on your kids. 
Don't give up on your mate. Don't give up on those people you work with. Focus in on the good. Seek God on their behalf. And wait on God to do a work in them. They're on a journey. And then number four. Are you ready for number four? If you're ready for number four, say amen. Amen. Fill your heart with God's love for them. Fill your heart with God's love for them. Do you know why people get on your nerves? It's because they're not on your heart. Listening and loving from the heart hears and understands. I didn't intend to share it like I did in the early service, but I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. Do you know that when my wife is comforted by me more than at any other time in her life? Do you know when she's more encouraged and senses and feels more love from me to her than any other time in her life? It's when she's sharing something And I stop whatever I'm doing and I look dead in her eyes and I listen to everything that she has to say and I understand where she's coming from. You understand that we all come from different backgrounds we all are, we filter everything through our past and our circumstances. And one of the great things that you can do in your relationships is to try to figure out where they're coming from, why they're saying what they're saying. Figure out, okay, I understand why she's saying that. I understand why she is saying that because. And you know what? That'll bless that relationship more than you could ever, ever imagine. Watch this with me in verse 8. You ready? For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now, you may have a different translation than I'm, I'm reading. I study a lot of uh, other translations, but I use this on Sunday morning. But, and, and if I bring another translation, it, it's okay, okay? But you, you, my, mine says bowels. What does yours say? Affection, all right? You understand that in the Greek culture, the Greeks believe that your emotions came from your insides. They came from your stomach. They came from your intestines. Your feelings come from your liver. But all of it came from inside. And what Paul is saying here to all of us at this point, he's saying, I have a gut feeling in my life. I have a gut feeling of love For you, a love that is so intense that it enables me to love those that are unlovable. You got anybody in your life that's unlovable? Know anybody like that? May I say to you, then you have to have a supernatural kind of love to love them back. Notice in verse number eight that he says, this gut feeling of love that I have for you is a gift to me from the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're going to love the unlovables in your life, You're never going to be able to do it in your own flesh. You're never going to be able to work it up. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit when he deposited himself in you. You have inside you, not in your own strength, but a supernatural love, a gift from Jesus 
to love the unlovables. In spite of all of the heartache and the difficulty. The Bible says in Romans 5, 5, God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit who is God's gift to us. It's poured into us by the Holy Spirit. Day by day, moment by moment. It's not something we can do. It is something that he does in us and through us. You know, life is too short to be miserable living with people around you that you don't love and they're killjoys. Life is too short. Paul starts his list here in Philippians. They will kill you unless you make the right choices to respond in the right way. Let me, let me review, if I can, just a minute what's been said. Number, number one, are there some people that you need to be thankful for? Um, are there some people that you have failed to appreciate? When is the last time you sat down and you wrote a little note to somebody just thanking them for who they are and loving on them with your words? When's the last time you invited somebody to dinner or prepared that dinner just to show them that you care and love them? Or let me just ask you this. Let me, let me go at this a little bit different. When somebody wrote you that note and thanked you, What went through your brain when you opened it up and you read it? Well, it's about time I got this note. (laughs) What in the world took them so long? I did this two or three weeks ago. I deserve this. If that's kind of the way that you approach it, may I say to you, I'm not being mean or ugly, you're just unpleasable. And God needs to do a work in your heart. Number two, who are you praying for? And are you praying specifically for God to do a work in their heart and their life? That they be filled with the love of Jesus, that they make righteous choices and decisions, that they do the right thing, and they are bearing fruit for Christ. Number three, who do you need to be patient with? Hello? Who is it in your life that you've been expecting way too much from and you're not giving God the glory and the gratitude for how far they've already come? And you want a whole lot more out of it. That frustration has built and it's robbed you of the opportunity to see what God's already doing and what he's doing in their life right now. Who do you need to be patient with? And then number four, who do you need to start loving with your heart rather than your head? Paul starts out this letter by addressing this church that he started, that he planted. They were in his heart. It was a koinonia. It was a fellowship. He was enjoying his church. And when you really, really love each other and enjoy each other, then that's what fellowship is all about. Now, without getting ready to leave, I'd like to ask you to stand with me if you would. So my question to all of us today is, <laughs> you preachers that are in here, you know exactly what I'm about to say. It's always intriguing to me to look at people during an appeal time and, and just look at people's faces and what, I wonder what they're thinking right now. You know, looking at the watch. And, what are you thinking about right now? 
What I want you to be thinking about is the people that are in your life. Are you enjoying the people in your life right now? Hmm? Or are you enduring the people in your life? You're just putting up with it. People in your family, the people you work with. How many of you now, when we begin to give this invitation in a minute, how many of you just need to find that nearest aisle and make your way here to the altar and start praying for those people that you're just having a hard time with? I mean, you're not focusing in on their good. You're focusing in on what they don't bring to the table. And I'm going to ask you to come today and then watch your attitude change. Watch your heart change when you start praying specific prayers just for those people that you're not enjoying life with right now. How many of you haven't been as patient with those people as you need to be? Why don't you come and ask God to do a work in your heart? I believe if two or three of you come, there'll be a lot that need to make these kinds of decisions. Father, um, thank you for the powerful word that Paul has been inspired by your Holy Spirit to give to us and to leave for us for our own understanding and our own lives that we could enjoy each other. I pray for this congregation of people that has gathered here and those that may be watching by live stream that need to make some alterations in their life, some attitude changes in their life, some approaches to life so that they could enjoy the people that you have placed around them. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.